Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this podcast. It's going to be a very interesting podcast with a very, very dear friend of mine and someone that I respect a lot, and I know him for over uh, 10 years at least. Uh, his name is Brian Hermans. He's a, an attorney and senior partner with the law firm of Morrison Mahoney, a Northeast regional firm with nearly uh, 200 attorneys. Uh, Brian heads the New York's office, which, which one is one of their biggest. Uh, has over 35 years of experience in civil litigation with an emphasis on trial work and the defense of cases involving professional liabilities, including medical and dental malpractice. Uh, Brian has defended cases involving death, catastrophic injuries, multi-million dollar exposure. He's a frequent uh, author and speaker for industry trade association and universities. And that's how I met him. Actually, I invited him to give a talk to my resident at that time when I was running the program at NYU. He was kind to give us his time the same way he is doing it right now. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for in a busy day like yours to give me time and uh, give some advice to the listeners about a very important uh, subject, something that we deal with it every day, every minute of the day, and how we can protect ourselves and how we can protect the patients and make our life less, uh, much easier. So with that, uh, Brian, I'm going to start with the first question. Uh, you know, we did the introduction about you. So what can you tell us about your experience uh, representing dentists specifically? I mean, it's almost the same between medical and dentist, but let's focus on dentist. Well, thank you first and foremost for having me. Uh, I often tell folks uh, with my dental practice that I divide the world into two worlds. Uh, world one in my mind is the administrative world, the and, and I practice, as you mentioned, in New York State, so I restrict my comments to the state I know and know best. Uh, in New York State, the uh, Department of Education has what we call the Office of Professional Discipline. They are the folks charged with making sure that dentists are doing what they should, representing the uh, profession well, and if someone's off the reservation doing what they shouldn't, they can jump in and uh, take the bull by the horns and steer things in a different direction. The other world, uh, the world that people think of most frequently, I suppose, when they think of lawyers is litigation, lawsuits, malpractice claims, uh, and suits. And so I certainly handle those as well. So I, I represent uh, dentists in OPD matters. In fact, I was down in Port Chester earlier today uh, defending a dentist who was being interviewed uh, uh, on the heels of a patient complaint. Uh, and uh, I've got plenty of uh, cases in the office, active lawsuits where I'm defending dentists of all shapes and sizes, typically general dentists, but at times uh, orthodontists and periodontists and endodontists, you, you name it, runs mm -hmm. the whole gamut. Good, but let's focus. You you are more on to the defense of dentists. All defense. I've, all defense. Uh, my entire career of 35 years has been nothing but civil insurance with so-called insurance defense litigation. So if you as a dentist get sued, uh, typically you notify your your uh, insurance company and then they assign a, a lawyer like me from a defense firm to defend you. Correct. If you get a call from the Office of Professional Discipline or a letter uh, and they're looking into a complaint from a patient, again, your insurance company will assign a lawyer like me to represent you and appear with you when interviewed. So uh, let's start with OPD, because that's uh, something that a lot of people don't have any idea about it until they face a call like that. So can you talk to us more about that? Sure. Uh, so the OPD, as I mentioned before, investigates and prosecutes so-called professional misconduct. And like most everything in my world, uh, it's statutory. And there is a list of various things that constitute quote unquote, professional misconduct. And if you'll bear with me, I'll just tick through the laundry list of things that uh, are problematic and can get into trouble as a dentist. One, and a lot of them are painfully obvious, obtaining your license fraudulently, practicing fraudulently beyond one's uh, scope of practice with gross incompetence or gross negligence, practicing while your abilities are compared, drunk, drug, uh, etc. Being habitually drunk or dependent on narcotics, 
being convicted of a crime, having been found guilty of professional misconduct in another state that would get you in trouble in New York. In other words, if you get found responsible uh, in Connecticut for professional misconduct, New York is going to get wind of that and vice versa. And when they do, they're going to want their pound of flesh typically as well to investigate and probably sanction you somehow or other. Uh, refusing to provide service to a person based on their race, their creed, their color, their national origin. Permitting or aiding or abetting an unlicensed person to engage in activities that require a license. I've had cases where the allegation is that my dentist was allowing staff to practice dentistry. Uh, practicing while one's license is suspended. Also, there's a category called unprofessional conduct. So we were just talking about professional misconduct. If you engage in so-called unprofessional conduct, that also is sanctionable by the OPD. And so the category of things that constitute unprofessional conduct include failing to follow, follow federal, state, or local laws, rules, or regulations, uh, exercising undue influence on the patient to exploit him or her in some way, shape, or form, uh, directly or indirectly offering, giving, or receiving, or agreeing to receive any fee or other consideration to or from a third party for referral of a patient. We get that even as lawyers, plaintiff lawyers that have, it's a no-no, it's not permitted, but runners, so-called runners, someone who works at a hospital gives you a call as a lawyer, hey, someone's here terribly injured, you might wanna give them a call and you gotta yourself a new client. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the dental field, you can't be sharing fees with others and having folks farm patients to you uh, and giving them a fee for that. Um, Permitting any person to share in your fees who is not a fellow professional, dentist, partner of the practice, et cetera. We have a similar rule for lawyers. Um, conduct which evidences moral unfitness, pretty vague category, but it's out there. Willfully making or filing a false report or failing to file a report required by law or impeding or obstructing such a filing. Um, revealing or uh, personally identify, identifiable facts, data, HIPAA violations, right? You, you, you know the details of your patient's background. Uh, you you got to lock that information down electronically and otherwise you can't, if you're treating uh, mom, dad, and two children, you can't divulge to mom or dad what child one or two told you that mom or dad don't want to hear or shouldn't know about. It's all private, each patient's even privacy. If, even if they are minors? If they're minors, that's a, Different call. story. Okay. Different story, right? But you mm -hmm. certainly there's a tendency, and I've run into this at times, where Dennis treats the entire family and yes. he or she becomes friendly with them all. And there's a tendency to start blurring the lines. Oh, daughter told me she's pregnant. What? <laughs> you know, uh, information that's private. Your daughter doesn't want mom to know that. So you got to use your head, I would say. If it's something that you think might result in a problem, Better to lock and it that's down. A, yeah, and that's a very important point. People miss it. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, you said something beyond one scope, and that's that's interesting because in, in New York State, the dentist basically is allowed to do wisdom teeth extraction, uh, implants. Uh, right. What is the, what's left? The, the, the area, the areas I think of that uh, sometimes become a problem are, what about Botox treatments? Yeah. You know, is that is that something again? I'm not a dentist. I don't, mm. I don't create the rules of what is, is or isn't one scope. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you what the rules yeah, yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If no, you're, I just wanted if, to. If uh, you yeah. know from your your training what you can do and not do as a dentist, and you are thinking about getting into something that may or may not qualify, I would look into it before, before just doing it and finding yes. out that maybe, in their opinion, you've gone beyond. Mm -hmm. um, Failing to make available to a patient copies of their documents is also unprofessional conduct. Mm -hmm. I've had cases where my dentist uh, says, the patient owes me money. I'm not going to give them the records. You can't do that. That's a no-no. Yeah. patient asks for the records, you've got uh, 10 days after they submit a written request, and you cannot withhold the records based on non-payment of uh, services. You also can't demand a fee for the copy of their records. They're entitled to them. Typically, when a patient wants copies of the records, uh, you can smell the smoke. <laughs> the fire is a brewing. Uh, they probably mm -hmm. are thinking about hiring a lawyer if they haven't already. And, and the claim, in my opinion, most often will come. 
Mm -hmm. That's a precursor to a suit. Yeah. Um, practicing or offering to practice beyond the scope permitted by law. Delegating a professional uh, responsibilities to a person who is not qualified. Performing services not authorized by the patient. Um, abandoning or neglecting a patient under and in need of immediate professional care without making reasonable accommodations. I've had a number of cases with that where things start to go sideways, the relationship starts to go sideways with your patient. And, you know, as a human being, you'd like to just walk away <laughs> because they're miserable and there's no pleasing them, right? Uh, you have to be very careful about not just leaving them high and dry, so to speak. So uh, uh, th let's touch on that because that's a very important sure. point. We all face it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so how would you, uh, you know, tell the patient in a very nice way that look, hey, it's not working between us. Uh, well, if you look it, at the rule, it says mm -hmm. abandoning or neglecting a patient under and in need of immediate professional care without making reasonable arrangements. So, if someone comes in with a an active infection, an abscess or something, that would be something that needs to I be think done. you'd agree require, needs treating mm. right now, like antibiotics mm. or some, mm. something that needs to be done about it. You can't just say, well, we're not getting along. Good luck to you, my friend. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, so in that circumstance, I would say probably, you know, prescribe the antibiotic, tell them what's going on, and then also have the conversation about. Referring them to of, another person, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I get the sense that you're not, uh, impressed with my abilities or taking my advice and, and, you know, maybe you'd be better served going to another dentist. I can uh, recommend another dentist. I've had clients say, I don't want to be a part of recommending anyone because whoever I recommend this person to is going to probably be someone I know and respect. And they're not going to be happy about the fact that I've sicked, you know, patient X on them. Um, so then maybe you cite them to the you know the the dental association because they have referral services right you can mm -hmm. find someone in their geographic region the point is you can't leave them high and dry in, in the yes. in the middle of the stream so to speak yes. right if nothing active is going on you've got plenty of time to do yeah. that you have responsibility towards them let's right. put it this way yes so here are some others uh harassing abusing or intimidating a patient failing to maintain a record for each patient at least six years and for patients that are 15 years of age or less until they turn 22. Um, using the word doctor and offering to perform professional services without also indicating the profession in which the licensee holds a doctorate. Failing to appropriately supervise persons who are authorized to practice only under the supervision of a licensed professional. Guaranteeing that satisfaction or a cure will result. Most doctors, certainly every lawyer I know, no one guarantee, there are no guarantees in the law or in medicine there's a pattern jury instruction that every jury that I've ever tried a case to hears from the court that there are no guarantees. You know, you do the best you can, uh, but People there are no hope guarantees. that treatment would work, yes. Right, but you, you don't ever say or write to your patient that, you know, this will definitely go well, uh, or I guarantee it. Uh, why create a higher duty of care for yourself than the law establishes? Uh, ordering excessive tests or treatment that are not warranted, claiming or using any secret or special method of treatment that you won't divulge to the Department of Education. Uh, I got a wonderful cure for such and such, but don't ask me to give you the details. It's the secrets, you know, the three secret sauce. That's a no-no. Uh, failing to wear an identifying badge indicating one's name and title if you're at a hospital or clinic group, et cetera, where many different docs are present. Uh, if you're operating under an assumed name, failing to post conspicuously the names and licensure fields of all principal licensees, issuing prescription drugs and devices that do not contain appropriate details, failing to use scientifically accepted infection prevention techniques, you know, that you're not just washing your tools in the sink, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, just, yeah. you're using the appropriate cleaning yeah. uh, uh, yeah. equipment, claiming professional superiority or special abilities beyond the AD, ADA and New York Board of Regents approved specialties such as endodontics, oral surgery, orthodontics, periodontics, uh, and last but not least, false advertising. So it's a pretty lengthy list. Yeah. But all of these, any one summer, all of these can be the type of thing that uh, gets them on your tail, investigating 
giving you a call, sending you a letter. Hey, send us your file. And then once they get the file, come on in for an interview. We want to ask you some further questions. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually interesting. I There's a lot of them that I had no idea about, uh, I have to say. Uh, Which is why I take the time to walk through it when I do presentations. And, yeah. You know, up and coming dentists or even experienced dentists, they, they haven't, if they've ever heard it, they don't remember having heard it. Correct. And I, I mean, I heard you before. Yes. To say, yeah. Shoot, <laughs> I, I'm doing that. Or like, I'm, For instance, a patient of 15 or less, I never thought about it, that uh, you you have to keep it till they turn 22. I don't, I've never heard that before, although I listened to you before, but I guess some, uh, you miss it without paying attention. Uh, right. Obviously there is things that they still vague, uh, which you said it before, which uh, makes it even more vulnerable for us to be exposed to these things. So, uh, so the, the ads must be kept for one year when they were talking about it. Uh, what are the pitfalls and the issues with advertising? Because that's a that is something that um, I mean I don't have experience with it. I I don't I've never find the need for advertising. But there is people that are very active, especially today with the social media. And I, I would like yeah, to talk about there's it. There's different ways to advertise, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the olden days, you might put an ad in the newspaper. Nowadays, uh, a lot of dentists have websites, which is a form of advertising. They might have ads in magazines. Uh, I represent a dentist to routinely advertise in magazines uh, about, you know, full, totally new teeth, you know, so you get patients that have maybe six natural teeth in their head still, and they're all lousy. And so the fix is remove those and slap them with a bunch of implants up and down and all new teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, advertising in general, you know, boils down to a, a few things, which is, um, don't post or blog anything about your patients. That's a no, no, right. Yeah. HIPAA reasons, yeah. et cetera. Uh, I recommend to my clients, uh, not Facebook friending or otherwise friending patients. Uh, not everyone does that, but I think it's a dangerous precedent to set. And it kind of blends the line between you as their doctor and them as your patient, even though you're friendly with them, maybe even consider them a friend, something about going the Facebook route, opened you up, I think, to letting your guard down. There's a lot of things that are posted and said and done through social media, Facebook among them, that are totally unprofessional, right? You wouldn't say in the in your office to a patient and allow them to say to you. Uh, and once you have that friendship online, you run the risk of blurring the lines, saying or doing or receiving and not responding to things that are unprofessional. So I, I advise against it. I don't do it with my clients as a lawyer. I recommend against it for, for dentists as well. So what if uh, they uh, follows you like on Instagram or on LinkedIn or whatever? Is this something you cannot control it? Anybody can follow anybody. Well, li LinkedIn is a little safer, I, I would say, because it's changed a bit in recent years. It's not nearly as formal as it once was. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't believe some of the stuff I see posted on LinkedIn nowadays that is in my opinion, totally unprofessional and more akin to Facebook or Instagram. Uh, some of the younger folks don't seem to understand the difference between what LinkedIn was created for and what, you know, Facebook yeah. was created for. D totally different purposes. One is more business or should be LinkedIn and the other is more social. Here's my kids, my dog. Uh, here's my opinion on politics, which is a third rail. You know, you, just, you don't go there with patients. Mm -hmm. shouldn't. Uh, you got a divided country and people with very strong opinions on things like that. Why invite, you know, disputes and disagreements with people who's really only interested in, in your, you know, your ability as your ability as a dentist? It shouldn't mm -hmm. be. Um, so limit uh, the forums and what you say. Uh, if you've got uh, social media presence or your your patient does and they're posting on the internet, and I've had this occur a few times over the years, negative comments about you. Mm. You know, you're a terrible dentist, and uh, I recommend that no one go to you. Uh, there's a temptation to immediately get online and fire back. Well, you're a terrible patient, and you didn't follow instructions. You're noncompliant, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I always tell my clients, to resist the temptation to do that. It, it's, it leads nowhere good when you respond in kind and get down into the, you know, the gutter with them. 
uh, better, I think, to look into a company like reputation.com where you pay a fee to have them manage your online uh, reputation. Typically, companies like that, as I understand it, will help you hide the negative review or comment about you, not by, you know, they can't take it down. What they can do is help you post a bunch of good reviews about you, which put that negative comment on to page two or three or four, where people don't generally go. So it doesn't disappear. It just falls away from immediate view. It's not the number one hit if someone Googles your name on the yes. internet. Mm -hmm. So in general, uh, people who base their practices on social media, you're telling them, be careful. This is yes, not something. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so moving along with these things. Uh, uh, so why is it important uh, to know these things about the professional misconduct? Well, uh, mainly because the, the Office of Professional Discipline has the authority to sanction you in a variety of different ways. Some of them, none of them fun, some of them quite severe. Uh, they can censure or reprimand you as a dentist. They can insist that you undergo additional training or retraining education. Uh, they can fine you up to $10,000 for every charge of which you are found guilty. Uh, and that's not a fine that you know, is covered by your professional liability insurance. That's out of your own pocket. Um, they can suspend your license wholly for a fixed period of time or partially until further training is received. They can uh, make you do up to 100 hours of public service. And worst case scenario, they can revoke your license, your livelihood for good. If you know you engage in behavior that's bad enough. I've never seen that, but you can imagine it's out there. If you've got a bad enough person out there doing bad enough uh, uh, stuff, <laughs> the license can go bye-bye. So I would say of the two worlds I practice in, um, the OPD cases are always more important to my clients than the lawsuit. The, the, the malpractice lawsuit, which I think we'll talk about, um, it's, a con it's concerning. It's not pleasant to, to defend one's reputation in the context of a lawsuit, but at least you know you have the benefit of insurance coverage that you've paid, hopefully, a premium to obtain, which is why I'm at your side defending you. Mm. Um, but in, before the OPD, the fines out of your pocket, not your insurer's pocket, and, uh, and the fees of the lawyer also. If well, no, the fees of the lawyer are paid by, by your professional liability insurer. So oh, okay. the, the professional liability insurer will hire me uh, to consult with you and to appear with you before the board and to give advice um, through the process. If necessary, you know, take it before the full board, try the case. All the defense of it is covered, but the, the, the fine the sanction if there is one, it's typically not something that, you know, the insurance covers. Mm -hmm. So, and that can be substantial. I mean, the OPD has it in their head that if they find you five grand, that'll get your attention and you'll be a good boy moving forward and not uh, do what they're, you know, uh, upset about. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot of money, mm -hmm. even for a solo, especially for a solo practitioner, you know, that kind of money. And I've seen that kind of fine trigger in in fairly routine cases of just not documenting the chart well enough uh, a lot of the dentists i represent before the opd are quite experienced and, and very good dentists in fact they've mm -hmm. just forgotten the importance of documenting their examination their findings documenting not only a treatment plan but why that's the plan mm -hmm. documenting that they got informed consent from the patient you know and so here they are now before uh, an investigator at the OPD and being asked, well, what was the treatment plan? Well, I was going to do whatever. Well, where does it say it in the chart? It doesn't. <laughs> where does it say that you got informed consent from the client? It doesn't. But trust me, I always get it. They don't want to hear that. They want to see that you've got it charted, that informed consent was obtained. So ideally, I like to see that uh, signed off on by the patient, but at a minimum, at least chart that you had the conversation about risks, benefits, alternatives, patient agreed, et cetera. Which we will get to it. Uh, that's something I learned from you and mm -hmm. uh, it's been very helpful. So apart from uh, the sanction 
Uh, what else is possible with the OPD? Well, uh, possibly it can become a public record. It depends on the sanction, right? If you lose your license altogether, um, if you're engaged in public service, you're out there, someone sees you raking leaves or whatever the mm -hmm. public service might be, uh, it can get out. Uh, possible collateral investigation by other enforcement agencies, such as Medicaid authorities, Department of Health, Attorney General's office, DA's office. I had an OPD case last year where the dentist I was representing was asked to appear and be interviewed uh, about billing practices of the office she used to work at. Uh, as it turned out, I don't think she was in any way, shape or form involved, but it, it looked to me from the questions being asked that the concern was the practice was miscoding treatments, overcharging for treatment, Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud, right? Mm -hmm. So my guess was that the owner of the practice, perhaps on his own or in cahoots with others, was miscoding, up, upping the, the, the dollars being charged. And somehow or other, they got wind of it. And now we're interviewing all the dentists who worked there then, and maybe even now, to find out what did you do on this day for this patient? I did a filling. Hmm. <laughs> That's not what was coded. That's not what was billed for. It was something far more extensive. And then, you know, they go after the owner of the practice. Um, so basically, so if you're licensed, yeah. I mean, we mentioned this earlier, but if if you're if you're sanctioned uh, uh, in New York by the OPD mm. and you're licensed in another state, typically the other state will get wind of the fact that you were sanctioned here and they will open their own investigation. And that's very common for me. I'll have a dentist who's investigated here in New York and within three or four months thereafter, along comes Connecticut where they're also licensed with the same questions. And again, wanting their pound of flesh, typically another fine, some sort of reprimand. Um, and then finally, the, the OPD findings uh, are reported to the so-called national National Practitioner Database. It's not a public record, but it's a, a database where insurers uh, and licensing boards can check your status if you've had a history or not. So again, a lot of bad things can happen sure. uh, as a result of an OPD yeah. investigation. It's like a credit score. Right. So your premiums goes up and stuff. So in regard to the district attorney and attorney general offices, that's basically when it gets to the Medicaid fraud and practices that practice with Medicaid as a, as, as an income. Right. Uh, I've had a, I've had a case where, you know, Dennis was alleged to have let uh, his office manager practice dentistry, you know, that if believed totally false accusation, but if believed that could potentially be criminal, right? If you're letting hmm? knowingly letting someone that is not licensed as a dentist practice dentistry, um, you know, again, it's a rare, circumstance but th that's an example of how bad things can get if you're really engaged in bad behavior don't be surprised if in addition to a, a fine and maybe losing your license you're in jail yeah uh, that goes yeah. without saying right uh so if you receive god forbid a paper from opd how would you respond to that well uh most of them start with a complaint from the patient or uh, a governmental agency but uh typically your first notice is a letter from the OPD requesting a copy of your records. Alternatively, I've had cases where the investigator may simply drop by your office uh, asking to speak with you or asking your uh, receptionist to provide a copy of the patient's file. Um, if and when that happens, my advice is to politely refuse to speak with the investigator until you have first had a chance to consult an attorney. You have a right to do that. Uh, also to advise your staff of that possibility. Uh, the first time years ago I had this circumstance arise where the investigator just dropped by the office. My dentist was totally in the dark that they could do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Susie or whoever he had out front just handed over the patient's file. This guy walked in, showed his credentials, and the, the, the file was handed over. It would have been handed over in any event anyhow, but uh, I think as the owner or manager of a practice, it would behoove you to tell your staff that this governmental body is out there. Here's what they do. Here's what they can do. If and when someone calls or drops by and wants to get a patient file, you don't just willy-nilly hand it over. 
you contact me immediately, wherever I am on the planet, uh, so that I can decide what to do about it. And then, and can you refuse to comply with the with the it's visit? It's not that you're refusing to comply. You're simply saying, "Listen, uh, I'd like to advise my insurance company that this is something that you're interested in looking into, uh, and get the benefit of counsel to respond." And in my experience, typically they agree to it. I, I don't know, to be honest, if if you had the you know the DA's office, let's say, dropping by on a Medicare fraud, they would give you the courtesy of waiting until you talk with a lawyer first. Yeah. They might just grab files and go. But yeah. in the garden variety OPD investigation where there's a pain, or, you know, a patient complaint, uh, the, the chart's the chart. I mean, unless they're really concerned, you're gonna create an entirely different chart. And I've had that happen too, uh, that has got his own problems, right? If you're a dentist and you're, once questions are being asked in the context of an OPD investigation or even a lawsuit, you mm -hmm. go back, throw the chart away and write up a new one. Uh, bad, bad idea. Uh, mainly because if your insurance company gets wind of the fact that you're playing hide the ball with your records, changing the records, sure. deleting pages, replacing them, they'll, they'll disclaim insurance coverage. You won't have the benefit of that liability insurance coverage that you paid premium for. So, uh, you know, my strong advice to any client is do not mess with your records. Your records are your records. Uh, nowadays with electronic, electronic charts, yes. it, it'll track through metadata every change right. you made, when you made it, whatever. But in the old Correct. days, when everything was on paper, you know, if you were a dishonest person, you could just tear a page out and write up a new one, right? Or use whiteout or whatever, fiddle with the records. That's a dangerous thing to do because, as I said, it might well jeopardize your insurance coverage, and you just don't want to do it. Correct. So, yeah, that's uh, that's very important. Uh, so, I I want to, although we're very very interested with OPD, but I want to move to the litigation just because of the time. I don't want to. Sure. Uh, uh, so. You are an expert in that. that. That's been your bread and butter for 35 years on top of the OPD. I think I myself, even I learned quite a bit with you tonight about the OPD. But let's uh, let's go to the thing that is more common, which is the, or more prone to, which is the malpractice insurance. Again, disagreement can happen with the patient. Mainly my experience, what I've heard, because I've done a lot of uh, consulting, you know, they used to send me to, uh, review charts and stuff mainly starts from money most of the time uh, they ended up with disagreement on when the money case failed things happen but they re refused to pay the back the money for the patients patients ended up suing them and probably the hassle and the stress of the whole thing was more expensive than this amount uh, do you agree with me on that by the way i'm or i'm i'm yes. a little bit off base Absolutely. And it's it's uh, the same is true for lawyers. Uh, the, the advice is the same. If, you, if a patient owes you, you know, 500 bucks, <laughs> you've got to really ask yourself, how how bad do I want that $500? If I hound, you know, the patient, hopefully, well enough to know is, is pursuing them with vigilance for $500 going to trigger an OPD investigation when they call or report me for having allegedly done something wrong? Or even worse, is it going to cause them to go to a lawyer who will then start sniffing around about possibly suing you for malpractice in response to the collection effort for $500? Mm -hmm. Is it really worth it to you? That's the same thing we go through as lawyers. If you're owed money on a legal bill, you've got to do that mental math. Thankfully, in my line of work, being insurance defense, uh, you know, insurance companies don't typically sue their, their lawyers. They have great leverage over us, right? They they put us on panel to defend their insureds. If they're unhappy with us, they take us off panel. They don't need to sue us. Mm. <clears throat> but that's the that's the concern you, you have to have. Uh, obviously, you have a right to pursue your, your your fee if you've generated it, but you've got to do the the further analysis. Who's the patient? How likely is this to result in a, a lawsuit? And if it, there's any chance of it, maybe the best play is to just let it go, write it off, yes. and tell the patient to move on. So if, uh, how, how much liability or how, how long is it, are we liable 
uh, for a malpractice after we finish treating a patient? Well, in New York, the there's a so-called uh, two and a half year statute of limitations. That's the general rule. Um, so that is measured from the date of last treatment for the issue at hand. So if they say you did a lousy job with a root canal and you did it on, you know, did it that service today, uh, they'd have two and a half years thereafter to file a suit against you. There are circumstances under which that time period is extended. So if, for example, uh, the patient aspirates a file uh, and they don't become aware of it until five years from now, then they, the clock would start ticking at the point they discover it or should have discovered it. So, you know, foreign objects extend. Uh, that's an example. Um, there's also what's known as the continuous treatment doctrine. So if you start treating a patient five years ago for a condition and you continuously treated them for that same condition all this time, that extends, extends, extends the starting of the clock running until you finish trying to resolve that issue. And it'll go back to when you began that treatment for that condition, not everything, that condition, that issue. Yeah. So uh, I was reading once about the certificate of merit. What, what, what is it exactly? Well, uh, in New York, most states have a, uh, a rule that requires that when you file a malpractice suit against the doctor, you also file what's known as a certificate of merit, which is basically an attestation from the plaintiff's attorney that he or she has consulted with a dentist and that the attorney is satisfied that there is a reasonable basis for the suit. Um, they're not required when they file the suit to identify who they spoke with, only to say that they spoke with someone and there's a rational, reasonable basis to march forward. Mm -hmm. The idea is to not inconvenience and bother busy doctors uh, with lawsuits. As a practical matter, it's not terribly difficult if you're a plaintiff's attorney to have a bevy of you know, dentists uh, at your beck and call that you can ring up on the phone and talk to for five minutes and have them say, yeah, it sounds like a, you got a you know, plausible claim there. And then that's enough to you know, move, move the case forward. There's also an exception for people that have, uh, that are indigent. You know, they can say, I don't have a lawyer. I don't have any money. The court will allow you to file the suit uh, and march forward, of course. And you see that sometimes in a, in small claims court. You know, mm -hmm. you get a, a disgruntled patient that sues for malpractice in a small claims court. They don't file a certificate of merit. They don't know they need one. But, of course, if and when the case is tried, they're uh, told that they can't win without an expert, a dentist, who will opine that you engaged in malpractice. It's not enough for them to come in as the patient and say, he really dropped the ball and I'm unhappy. That's not enough. You have to have a medical expert or dental expert in this uh, circumstance to say that what you did deviated from good and accepted practice. It was a malpractice. So what is a malpractice? Well, uh, it's professional negligence, uh, otherwise uh, described as the failure to use reasonable care, uh, a deviation or departure from accepted uh, practice. In New York, we have, as I mentioned earlier, so-called pattern jury instructions, just black letter law that the judge reads to the jury before they go out to deliberate. And uh, our charge says as follows, uh, a dentist must have that reasonable degree and knowledge and skill that is expected of an average dentist in the community in which the dentist practices. Every dentist is expected to keep reasonably informed of new developments in his field and to practice dentistry in accordance with approved methods and means of treatment in general use. So as a defense lawyer, what I like about the charge is it's the reasonable dentist. It's the average dentist, not the best dentist on the planet. Reasonable, average, you know, same standard really applies in some ways to uh, people that own premises. You have an obligation to reasonably maintain your business or your, your home, right? So people don't trip and fall on your property. Not to make it bulletproof, not to be the, you know, the safest place on the planet, just reasonable, reasonable. And the jury decides, based upon the expert testimony, whether you uh, met that standard or not. And they hear typically testimony from the plaintiff's expert who says that you did not uh, do work properly, that you deviated from good and accepted practice. And then they hear testimony from you as the defendant dentist and 
your expert dentist to say you did. And then they have to decide who they believe. So, uh, you know, you're a very experienced dent uh, uh, lawyer. <laughs> well, you're almost experienced dentist because you, you know, you reviewed a lot of cases like that. But in your experience, what are the most, I'm going to ask you basically three questions in one and we can move from there. Um, what are the Mac practices cases that you see often? Uh, informed consent, how important it is. Uh, so let's start with those two and then we, we, we can go from there. Sure. So the cases I see uh, most often in the dental malpractice field, uh, first I would say are paresthesia cases uh, occasioned by injections and extractions. So the claim will be uh, you gave me a mandibular block injection and you nicked the nerve or severed the nerve and now I've got numbness and tingling, which didn't just last a short period of time. It's, it's permanent. I've got this area of my lip or chin or cheek that's permanently numb and uh, shame on you for having nicked the nerve. Typically the defense is, it happens. It's a uh, uh, blind injection, right? You got anatomical uh, landmarks to where to place the needle. I'm sorry, it happens. Um, so the claim often is, well, when you nick the nerve and I've got this shock-like sensation, you didn't immediately stop and retract. You kept going with the needle. That's the departure. Not hitting it, continuing on with the injection once you knew or should have known that you struck the nerve. Uh, extractions with paresthesia cases, it's you knew or should have known as my dentist that I had uh, close proximity between the nerve, right, and the root of the tooth you were extracting. And because of that, you dropped the ball and failing to refer me to an oral surgeon who would have presumably done a better job and not have damaged my nerve in the way that you did. Um, another common claim is uh, files dropped or swallowed or aspirated. Uh, another one for endodontists, uh, root perforation, overfillings, you know, how, how much uh, beyond the apex is an appropriate amount of overfill? It happens, we know that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I've had cases that I've tried where, you know, is a one or two or even three millimeters beyond the apex acceptable? Probably yes. Gets much more beyond that, mm, becomes a problem. Obviously, you're not trying to overfill, but a certain amount can uh, seep beyond. Um, failure to diagnose root resorption, not taking a sufficient number of x-rays over time to see the train coming down the track, so to speak. Uh, failure to diagnose and treat gum disease, cancer, uh, improper and uncomfortable placement of veneers, crowns, bridges, and TMJ problems. I've had a lot of those cases. Um, patient comes in, they're 65 years old, their teeth look like hell, and they say, I want teeth that look like 20-year-old Britney Spears. Rather than say, wait a minute, it's probably an unrealistic uh, expectation. Uh, a fair number of my uh, clients have just said, sure, <laughs> well, I'll try, uh, and uh, have not always been uh, as forthcoming as I think that maybe they should have in saying that we've got to have realistic expectations here. Do you really want teeth that are as white as copy paper when we're not going to fix all your teeth. We're only going to fix some of them. And the, all the other teeth in your mouth are, you know, uh, jaggedy brown. and yellow. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, they're not going to match. So shade, coloration, maybe not explaining to the patient that it's a process when the new veneers are placed or the new teeth are placed. The fit, you know, you've got three natural teeth. We're going to take those out. Everything in your head from this point forward is going to be new. Well, guess what? It's not going to feel like something you're accustomed to because you haven't had real teeth in your head for a long time. And it takes time. It might take many months until mm -hmm. you feel comfortable with it. So uh, I often find myself saying to dentists that handle this type of work, be more upfront with your, your patients about the expectations. It's a process. They might have to come back and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak until it feels right, looks right, et cetera. Um, and then as I alluded to earlier, failure to refer is a common claim. If you're a general dentist and you're not referring a patient out 
to an oral surgeon where arguably you should have. Maybe it's an impacted wisdom teeth. A lot of the insurance policies I defend under won't cover a general dentist for attempting to extract an impacted wisdom tooth. You're just not covered for it. It's excluded under the policy because they want you to refer it out to an oral surgeon who hopefully will do it without any problems. Um, but I find it ironic that they allow them to put implant just by taking a course, uh, CE course. Doesn't matter what kind of a course it is, it is still a CE course and it's, it's a surgical uh, intervention. It can be serious. Uh, <laughs> And, so uh, most most of the good general dentists I represent uh, stick to their lane, so to speak. They know yeah. what they can do. They 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 know what they could probably do some other stuff and probably get away with it, but they just are cautious. And they say, you know what? It's not worth the extra money I could make here and there doing the occasional extractions. I don't do them. I refer to you know my buddy down the street who's an oral surgeon. Every patient he Very takes dentist. care of. It. Periodontist, don't forget. Or periodontist, <laughs> well, you know, whatever. Someone other than me. I'm joking. No, I just, I know, I know. Keeps, keeps you yeah. out of trouble. Yeah, no, uh, it's a. Uh, so the, the informed consent, you know, written or oral. So, well, because the, you know, I, I'm, just to tell you that I had a case today, you know, and she came to me and I explained to her the risk that if we do this, we might have a a a, a a problem with her nerve, okay? So I did that in the consultation as a oral information. Now, informed consent is when we go to the, do the procedure, they sign for it. You taught me something that I've been sticking to it and I added when, when we did the forms of surgery at NYU at that time in, in the electronic health record, I added it actually. Should I've given you credit for it, but it, there's no credit there, so. Uh, uh, that you know, I've I've reviewed they them the alternative, the pros, the cons, the whole nine yard, and they agreed. And then you told me initial next to it. So that's something I've been doing it nonstop. Uh, so I have you know I I gave you a little bit, but just let's let's think about it. So you made them write, you made them read the informed consent. They might say, "Hey, I didn't know much about." It. Uh, they they handed it so, to me and uh, and I signed. So, informed consent. There's there's no there's no rule that says informed consent has to be in writing. There there isn't. Mm. But I recommend it strongly. Mm. It's the reason you recommend people having a written contract as opposed to an oral contract. There's there's such a thing as an oral contract. You and I can verbally agree that I'm going to buy your boat for, you know. $100. Uh, and then a month later, I say, where's the boat? And you say, what are you talking about? Well, we had an agreement. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. You know, it's the old, you know, it, it's not worth the paper. It's not written on. The reason you have written contracts is so that it takes away the ambiguity, the likelihood that you're going to have things unravel down the road. For the same reason with informed consent, I strongly advocate getting it all in writing. So again, back to the pattern jury instruction in New York, the, the charge that the jury hears is as follows. Before obtaining a patient's consent to an operation or invasive diagnostic procedure or the use of medication, a dentist has the duty to provide certain information concerning what the dentist proposes to do, the alternatives to that operation, procedure, or medication, and the reasonably foreseeable risks of such operation procedure or medication. It is the dentist's duty to explain in words that are understandable to the patient, all of the facts that would be explained by a reasonable dental practitioner so that when the patient does in fact consent, that consent is given with an awareness of one, the patient's existing physical condition, two, the purposes and advantages of the operation, procedure or medication, three, the reasonably foreseeable risks of the patient's health or life which the operation, procedure, or medication may impose. Four, the risks involved to the patient if there is no operation, procedure, or use of medication. And five, the available alternatives and the risks and advantages of those alternatives. So it's risks, benefits, and alternatives to what you're proposing, not doing anything at all, or other alternatives. Mm -hmm. And all of that can be oral. Uh, and historically, I think it has been 
predominantly for general dentists. And then if they're smart, they'll write in the chart, you know, talk with patient about risks, benefits, and alternatives of my suggested treatment plan, doing nothing, or option you know, B, if there was an option B. Uh, better dentists reduce all of that to writing. And the, the, the gold standard, as far as I'm concerned, is typically what oral surgeons do. We've had this discussion, but oral surgeons, because they're doing more invasive procedures, are usually pretty good about having absolute killer informed consent forms that will spell out all the risks and benefits and alternatives of the procedure and have the patient sign off on it. That way, if something goes sideways, the patient can't say, I didn't know that could happen. Well, it's right there in black and white on that form you signed. Yes, you did, right? It just, it, it puts you and your lawyer defending you in a much better position to say, it was all there in black and white mm. and you signed off on it. It's not just in my chart with me signing it, saying we discussed it and you're saying, no, we didn't, <laughs> you know, again, Charting it for yourself and signing it is good. The better practice is to put it all in black and white and have the patient sign off on it. So what else do you recommend to put into the, because I, I, before I forget about that, but for instance, recently we have a lot of resistance uh, in patients to uh, take extras. And in dentistry, without an x-ray, we're blind. It's like you're asking me to, I don't know, uh, see something with my eyes and it's impossible to see. Uh, and then things go wrong and uh, the patient say, well, I've, I've never been told that I need to have an x-ray. They, they don't want x-rays for two reasons. Some of them are afraid to pay the extra money for it or radiation fear, which it's right. it's not true, but let's let's well i guess qu question one is uh, you know a question that you can only answer as a dentist i can't right if if you if you know that it's it's not good and accepted practice that it's not the standard of care to proceed with procedure x in the absence of an x-ray then don't do it just don't do Dude, it. forget about doing the procedure when they come for routine checkups right you know and they are you know, they don't want, they reject x-rays. I don't have time. I don't do this. I don't do that. And some things happen down the line. Then at, at, a, at a minimum, I think you'd want to chart the fact that, you know, you've discussed with the patient, the importance of doing periodic, you know, x-rays. Yeah. X-rays. Mm -hmm. And here's the reasons why, because problems can be discovered sooner in time and dealt with before they snowball into a big mess that is painful and, uh, may result in the loss of teeth or other, you know, terrible problems. Patient refuses over, you know, over my advice. The that initial... stands in a court of law. Yes. The, the only risk in charting it with just you writing it in your chart and you initially is the patient may say down the road, you never told me that. I don't dispute that's what your chart says, but I deny that you we ever had that conversation. So how about if the hygienist writes it because they are the one in the front line? It, in those it's this. It's the same. It's the same uh, risk mess, as a right? dentist. Yeah. Right. The, the the patient can always say that says you. That's what your chart says. But I deny that you ever told me that. So you so know, you recommend to have a form that it doesn't I would need offer to be a form because that's. That, 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 does that happen all that often to you that the patients won't? Oh, yeah. Won't I mean, one of okay. the new locations that I have now, uh, there's a huge resistance on x-rays. And uh, mm -hmm. I can understand it. I've never faced it that much uh, like that. And it, it creates a problem because, you know. So maybe, you maybe, maybe you'd want to put together a draft, you know, uh, document that basically says, here's here's why we recommend x-rays. Here's the, all the reasons that, you know, they're it's the standard of care to get them and why we recommend them and blah, 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 blah. Here's the upsides. Here's the downsides. And uh, this will acknowledge that you're refusing to have it done. Blah, blah, blah. And they sign off. But they, as I pointed out earlier, if you know as a dentist that you should not be doing this or that procedure in the absence of an x-ray, don't do it. But because... that goes back to the abandonment of the patient. Well, it's not. If you it's tell the patient, look, I just... cannot see you anymore because you refuse to take x-rays. 
Well, but, but again, when we talk about abandonment, it talks about immediate harm, mm. immediate problems. So if, you, mm. if you don't have any reason to believe that they are in immediate harm, right? Then you can uh, abandon them. You can say to them politely, uh, professionally, I'm sorry, I am not going to treat you if you won't allow me to do what I know has to be done in order to treat you properly. I'm not going to fly the plane in the dark. You've got to allow me to use modern day technology to properly diagnose you and keep you out of harm's way. And if that's unacceptable to you, which I respect that you're right, you're the patient, you can refuse anything you want. It's your body. Uh, but I as well have, a, you know, I'm duty bound to, to practice in a certain way. And it's in, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to practice in a way that is not in keeping with good and accepted practice. What I know to be required for the proper practice of dentistry. You can't tie one hand behind my back and ask me to do. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's that's exactly. Thank you for describing it this way. We're 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 hand tied and and we are taking the responsibility of it every six months or three months. They come for a cleaning and we we don't know what is happening. So because we don't want to make the session too long. I always uh, uh, promise my uh, uh, my uh, listener to make it short, but it's such an interesting subject that we we really went over. But there's two things at the end. There is, if you get sued, and there is two options. Either you settle uh, the case, and that's what usually malpractice insurances love to push for, or you fight it. You can win, you can lose. So in case you lose, what is really can be expected to be recovered? Uh, secondly, if you settle, what is the impact on you as a licensee uh, kind of a thing? So if you please give us, this is very important for uh, the dentist listeners or even physicians. Sure. Well, most professional liability insurance policies require that the dentist consent to settle the case, if the case is to be settled. Not always. Sometimes uh, if you're no longer an insured of that insurance company, they don't need your consent. They don't care to have it one way or the other because you're no longer an active insured of theirs. But typically the, uh, the policy requires your consent and you... Uh, have to consent in order for the case to be settled. It can your consent cannot be unreasonably withheld. So if it's absolutely crystal clear that you engaged in malpractice and yet you're refusing to settle, uh, they can basically send you what we call uh, you know hammer letters saying you either consent or if the case comes back against you, you're going to be on your own for what we could settle it for today. And that normally will trigger the consent. Oh wait a minute. I'm going to be on the hook personally for the dollar figure over the amount you could settle the case for today. I'll consent. Thanks. Um, so again, I respect uh, my clients. A lot of them, you know, you can understand are, are very proud dentists. They, they are convinced they did nothing wrong. They want to fight to the death uh, and they want the case tried. And if there's a you know decent argument that they did not engage in malpractice, uh, most insurers are happy to have us, you know, try the case. Uh, there are a lot of cases, however, where it's it's questionable, right, whether the the case will be won or lost at trial. And I like in you know, any good lawyer or any good dentist, I make no guarantees, right? Juries are they do crazy things. They and no nobody that I know who has been around as long as I or, or less even that tries cases. Uh, can guarantee a result. And most good trial attorneys will tell you they've won cases they expected to lose and they've lost cases they expected to win. It's in some ways a crapshoot. And for that reason, 98 or 9% of all cases do settle at some point or other. Why? Because neither the plaintiff, the suing party, nor the defendant wants to have a bunch of strangers decide their fate. It may go very good or very bad. And it's, it's not a half enchilada scenario. It's either the whole enchilada or nothing at all. Yes. Plaintiff doesn't want to get the goose egg and the defendant doesn't want to be found liable after a full-blown trial on the merits because that result is reportable to the national practitioner, a national practitioner database, which again is not a public database, but it's out there. So very often I find myself, myself at the end of a case talking to my client about what do you want to do? Do you want to settle the case or do you want to try it? Well, 
as you pointed out. If I settle, you know, what happens? Well, if, it, if it's settled, that's reportable to the National Practitioner Database, but it's a settlement. If you try the case and you win it, you're happy as a clam, the case goes away. But if you try the case and you lose, that's reportable to the database. Which would you rather have reported to the database? Uh, a loss after a full-blown trial on the merits or a settlement that you begrudgingly agreed to because you were too busy with your practice to give up a week or two of your life to sit during a trial, which is what's required. If the case is going to be tried, normally it's a good week or two of your time out of the office, away from your patients, not making money, while you sit there looking the part of a concerned defendant, Dennis, uh, taking the case seriously, right? If you if you just show up for a two-hour cameo to give your testimony on day three of a two-week trial, guess what message that sends to your jury, right? You really don't care how the case is resolved. You're too damn busy doing something else, vacation, seeing patients. So my strong advice is always, if you're going to try the case, be there from opening statements until verdict, looking like you care about how the case is resolved. Um, the jury is there suffering through all the evidence and being asked to make a decision. You don't want them thinking that you're not taking it as seriously okay. as they're being asked to. Yeah. Good. Well, Brian, I can't thank you enough for making the time. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you. Uh, this is probably my seventh time when I'm hearing you, and I still learned a lot of things tonight. Uh, Brian is a very experienced uh, lawyer, uh, and he had invited me once to watch him in litigation. He has a very soft voice, not a real a harsh litigator, but he wins. I don't know what's your charm, but that's uh, that is a beautiful thing. So thank you very much, Brian. Have a wonderful new year. And uh, I hope I don't need you, but uh, nobody knows. Thank All you, right. Dr. Thank again. you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.